everybody. So we are making progress through the book. We've been at this, what, how many years? Well, this is, this is chapter 61. We do one a month, except during winter retreat. So nine into 61 is, uh, oh, yeah, we've been doing this for quite a while. <laughs> uh, how many chapters are there all together? We should see here. And then, of course, by the time we reach the end, we'll have forgotten the beginning, so we'll have to start over. 69 chapters. Okay, so another year. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, Russell Colts and I wrote this book together. He's a psychology professor at, at uh, Eastern and also a, a clinical psychologist. So it was our endeavor to bring Buddhism and psychology, you know, to show some similarities and and different. We didn't get too much into the differences here because uh, he restrained me from talking about rebirth and karma and I restrained him from talking about chemicals in the brain. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but, you know, very good interchange and we share a lot in karma, common anyway. So some chapters I wrote, some chapters he wrote. This one is one that he wrote. Okay. Um, so it's called Fear of Compassion, Steadfastness, and Thawing in Our Own Time. <laughs> so he, he's talking about uh, fear of compassion. As I read, you'll, you'll see what he's talking about, um, especially of people who have learned maybe from when they were when they were little that uh, other people are not so safe, and it takes them a while to, you know, learn to trust. So he's talking about it in that context, particularly uh, working with children uh, who have had, you know, not very good family backgrounds, and then. Uh, when they're older children trying to get placed and it's difficult, um, you know, for them to grow up to be an ad adults who trust. But I think also, he writes it in that context, but I think also it's, it, he calls it that fear of compassion. So kids that are, don't feel comfortable always when they're shown affection and love, they can't register it because, you know, they've been, had experiences earlier that taught them that other people weren't safe. But also, uh, in a different context, um, I would call it fear of friendship, you know, where people are already adults or teenagers or whatever, and other people want to be friends with them, but they don't feel comfortable. It's hard, again, to to relax and trust somebody else. So trust is the, is the big issue here. Yeah. And so I want to make it specially so that we're aware of this isn't just uh, something that applies to kids. Yeah. But this is also applies, and it isn't just in the context of uh, showing love and compassion to kids who've had uh, difficult upbringings or experiences. But it's a similar mechanism for people who, uh, you know, kind of step back a little bit from making close friendships. It takes them a while to, to really uh, trust and want to uh, be open with other people. Okay, so that may apply to us. It may also apply to people that we want to be friends with, but we find our, our, you know, they pull back and what's going on with them. Okay? So, we'll start reading. 
So as we've discussed, one of the most compassionate gifts we can give another person is the gift of feeling safe. So Russell has talked before about different um, kind of types of minds that we have. One is is the mind feeling threat. You know, another one, the mind feeling safe. And the third one is the mind feeling ambition or wanting to get something. So here, uh, you know, we talk about people feeling safe. Either feeling safe uh, emotionally, being with somebody that 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 person is not going to attack them or betray their trust, or feeling safe physically that they're not going to get physically harmed by somebody else. So he's saying one of the best gifts we can give somebody is that feeling of safety, yeah. And people feel safe. It's not always the same thing that makes everybody feel safe, yeah. And it's not always the same degree of whatever it is that makes people feel safe, yeah. So for some people, safety is, is you know, the physical environment. For other people, safety is the tone of voice of the person that they're with. Or for other people, the feeling safety is about being able to talk to somebody else. So it, it's it's quite different, and it, it might be interesting to look in ourselves and see what, uh, in what kind of uh, situations and with what kind of behavior from other people do we feel safe. Uh, just gives us some more information about ourselves so that when we know we're going into a situation that may be challenging, we uh, we can understand our mind and, and not be all uh, gunned up about, oh, I'm unsafe. You know, if we know we're going into a certain situation that we often don't feel safe in, it's like, Okay, I can relax. These are mother sentient beings. We do some meditation on the kindness of others before we go into the situation. Or uh, imagine any uh, Chenrezig coming into the situation with us. And, you know, we feel protection that way. Okay. So if we look at our own experiences, we will most likely discover that the people who have been the best at helping us feel safe are themselves warm and compassionate. That's generally true. However, somebody can be so warm and compassionate that another person feels smothered. (laughs) Yeah? So what I said about different things make different people feel safe. You know, here's one of them. Yeah. So, uh, but here he's talking in general, warm and compassion. What does warm mean? Yeah. Oh, friendly, maybe. Yeah. Um, They have a way of accepting and directing warm, unconditional kindness to everyone they meet, creating the sort of interactions that help others feel supported, comforted, and at peace. And we all know that we have people in our life that are like that. When we're around them, we, yeah, we feel supported. We we feel safe, you know. And then there's other people who, uh, you know, maybe for whatever reason inside them, uh, they like to bully other people or pick on other people or whatever. And... So we don't feel so safe around those people unless we build up our uh, our own reserve of fortitude and kindness so that uh, if somebody comes on strong, we don't. They come on like this, so we go like that. Or they come on like this, and we whack them back, you know. So we don't want either of those reactions. You know, somebody comes on like this, and to be able to stand there and say, yes, okay, now what? (laughs) Yeah. 
instead of uh, us coming, you know, getting so uh, triggered by it. Although most of us would like to be this kind of friend, the warm, compassionate ones, to others, uh, things don't always work out the way we'd hope. As we've explored, some of us have had histories of hurt or abuse and were neglected by those who should have taken care of us. One way or another, we may have learned that trusting others can be dangerous. Okay. And I think this is where some of the Dharma methods are so valuable. Um, because if we've learned that trusting others can be dangerous, you know, it's so easy to go through your whole life with that kind of distrust. And then your whole life is not very pleasant and your relationships aren't very pleasant. Um, because the mind is still seeing everything, everything through that lens of not safe, not safe, always looking for what could harm me. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, we can definitely use Dharma practice to help ourselves feel safer, even if the environment itself isn't so safe. But here he's talking about the other person, but we'll see. Okay. So one way or another, we may have learned that trusting others can be dangerous. When this happens, we may feel threatened rather than comforted by close interactions with others, even when we know that they have good intentions and sincerely want to help us. Okay. Have you ever been in the situation of People being warm and friendly, but um, you still feel threatened. Anybody ever been? Have you been in situations where you've been warm or friendly to somebody else and watched them still feel threatened and back away? Yeah, so we could be on either side of this at different times. Our minds can subconsciously learn to associate feelings of threats with people or situations very quickly and powerfully. And then he gives an example of that. Um, kind of, yeah, an unusual example. So Don Siegel, who I don't know who it is, um, writes about an elderly woman with Alzheimer's disease who is unable to form new memories. Every day her doctor comes to her and every day it's as if she is meeting him for the first time. She has no memory of their previous interaction. One day, the doctor plays a bit of a nasty trick, <laughs> hiding a tack in his hand so that when they shake hands, she is poked. That's mean to do to somebody with Alzheimer's, isn't it? I almost skipped over this story, but anyway. Uh, the next day, this woman still couldn't remember the doctor, but she refused to shake his hand. Although she didn't remember being poked, the threat centers of her brain and unconscious mind had learned to associate shaking hands with danger. Learning not to trust can occur at a very basic ev level. Actually, the custom of shaking hands is to express that you're not in danger, okay? I think it evolved, you know, in the Wild West. Well, we're living in the Wild West <laughs> right now, you know, where most people were right-handed. If you had a gun, it was in your right hand. So you shook hands with your right hand, okay? In Tibetan culture... Uh, people were harmed by saying mantras and spells. So the Tibetans often, uh, as a greeting when they meet new people or uh, somebody they respect, they stick out their tongue to show that they're not doing any kind of spells or mantras. Yeah, different culture. So the conditioned fear of closeness with others is sometimes called fear of compassion. That sounds very strange to me. Um, again, but this is 
written by a psychologist. <laughs> With all due respects to psychologists. Um, okay, sometimes called fear of compassion, and it can make relationships very complicated. We can both desperately want to have close, supportive, or intimate friendships with others and find ourselves being anxious and frightened when we're in such relationships. I think that's fairly common, huh? Yeah? Then I, Russell's referring to himself, I do some work with a residential facility for children and adolescents called the Hutton Hutton Settlement in Spokane, Washington. Many of the children who now live there have had experiences that taught them not to trust others. Some found themselves taken in by well-meaning, loving families. You know, like they're, uh, they've been placed in, in families. But not all of the foster families are loving, compassionate, and well-meaning. I've heard really bad stories with, with some families the way they treat the kids. But here, you know, there are some who are well-meaning and very kind uh, to the kids. So some found themselves taken in by well-meaning, loving families who had the best of intentions to provide these children with safe, loving homes. These families had visions of enveloping these young people in love and support and expected that the children would attach to them in return, feeling safe and thriving. The reality was often very difficult. In response to these families' efforts at creating closeness, the children often withdrew or even became aggressive. Yeah, because they felt that close relationships were dangerous. These kids had learned that people who were supposed to take care of you could hurt you or disappear when you most needed them. So instead of attaching and loving these families back, the children fought them, testing the relationships, distancing themselves, acting out, and having extreme emotional reactions, just the way we act in situations of threat. Okay, anybody who's taught elementary school or junior high or high school or college is very aware of when this happens with with the students, yeah, and the reaction, and it can come out of nowhere. You know, the day started out good, and then... One small thing happens and somebody gets triggered and they're, they're bouncing off the walls. Yeah, figuratively. Okay. Feeling upset and threatened that their honest attempts to care for the children were being rejected, these parents would sometimes respond by distancing themselves from the children in turn. Okay, so they're trying to be close to the kids, the kids are like this, and then bounce away, so then the the foster parents withdraw. Okay, this cycle creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that inadvertently confirms these child's greatest fears, that despite the parents' good intentions, their support would not be there when the going got tough, so they couldn't be trusted. This dynamic was played out again and again and ended with the children being placed outside the home or in another foster home. Okay, so the kids... Are, are afraid of, of somebody coming close and, and showing kindness to them. They back away. Yeah. The people who want to be kind back away. Yeah. And then the kids say, uh, yeah, I, I knew this. They can't be trusted. Okay. Now, sometimes what, what's really difficult is if you're in the, 
if you're in a situation where you want to help somebody and they back away, it's very natural just to step aside. There's the step aside of, well, I'm trying to help you, but you know, you can't be helped and you're too obstinate and I'm not going to waste my time on you. So I withdraw and I'm going to stop helping you. That doesn't help the other person. Okay. If, if, uh, you, you have to back up a little bit. You know, if the child is not reacting, you have to back up. Yeah. And not, maybe not be so warm. Uh, but that doesn't mean being cold. Yeah. And it doesn't mean being rude and cutting the kid out. It means, um, giving some, giving people the time and space they need to go through whatever process they're going through so that they can connect with somebody else. And this happens with friendships too. You know, you're becoming good friends with somebody. Yeah. I'm sure people have had this happen. You're becoming good friends with somebody, and then all of a sudden that person backs away. And you're going, what? What did I do? What happened? I don't remember anything happening. And now they, you know, they're, they're backing away. And, you know, um, so it can happen with adults too. Yeah. Uh, so that's what not fear of kindness with, as it is with the kids, but fear of friendship, you know, adults who, you know, okay, I'll get close, but mm, I've had bad experiences. I don't want to get so close that I get hurt again. Okay. Now, there's also another element. He doesn't mention this in here, but sometimes the people want to help the children so badly that they come on too strong. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you poor little kid, I'm going to hold you all the time and give you this and that and the other. And it's like, whoa, the kid's nervous system gets fried. It's not used to that kind of thing. Okay. And it happens in friendships too. One person comes on so strong that they want to be friends that the other person's going, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I want to get to know you better. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who you are yet. So it's, you know, when these things happen, nobody really means harm to anybody else. It's just people are reacting out of, uh, their own visions of reality. Yeah. And one person's vision of reality is this is unsafe. And the other person's vision of reality is, oh, they're wonderful. I want to be friends with them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, then, then of course things don't, don't click properly. And it really takes some time. To, to befriend somebody because they, yeah, they need to, to, uh, feel safe. But also, the person who wants to be friends needs to chill out, <laughs> you know, and, and not just, you know, feel, oh, everybody's like them and jump in. Or also, there's the dynamic of sometimes some people are attracted to people who tend to withdraw because they're afraid of, of closeness, you know, whether they're kids or adults. But they have the mind of, you know, I'm going to save that person. Yeah, I'm going to be the one who steps in and weathers everything with them and teaches them how to trust. And that will make me special. I'll be the special person to that person who will love me forever because I, I saved them from being walled off. People know what I'm talking about? Yeah? And, uh, you know, you don't see your, the, the person who's coming on too strong doesn't see themselves as... Uh, they think they're being really kind and they don't see what they, their ego is getting out of the situation, which is, 
you know, I want to be special to somebody. I, we all want to be special, don't we? So in one way or another, we're special to somebody. Yeah, I'm special to my cat. You know, it's like she knows me best, and so, okay. Uh, but but sometimes, you know, it's if we have the same, if I'm going to save somebody, I'm going to be the person that draws them out, that helps them know that they can be safe. I'm going to be the one person they can be safe with. I'll be special. Mm -hmm. So this this is a uh, um, a dangerous situation where you're doing something kind, but the motivation is not clear. Yeah, the motivation is quite mucky. Many of us may find ourselves in positions where we want to help others who are afraid of compassion, I would say afraid of closeness. Yeah. How do we help those who have learned to distrust the very relationships that can feel help them feel safe? So there's one way to say that sentence. How can we help them, you know, uh, to, to feel safe? And then there's another way of saying the sentence with our st sticky fingers of attachment of how can I make them feel safe with the undertext of then I will be their special person and I can feel important. Okay. It's amazing how many sentences you can say that the words are exactly the same, but depending on how you say it, they can mean two different things or be coming from two different places. Okay, but in this one, uh, he says, this is the task faced by countless teachers, therapists, clergy, mentors, and volunteers, for example, at homeless shelters and rape crisis centers. It starts by learning how trust works. Okay. A store here in Spokane, he's giving a, a little um, example here. A store here in Spokane sells pre-cooked frozen shrimp, which need only to be thawed before serving. You can tell this is Russell's chapter. <laughs> yeah. um, doing so requires a bit of preparation, though. The instructions on the bag are very clear. Thaw by placing in refrigerator overnight. Do not force thaw under running water. If you thaw the uh, prawns by running water over them, they can't absorb too much water. Oh, they can absorb too much water and become mushy. They just can't handle it. <laughs> they can't handle all that warm water at once. <laughs> they can't be forced to thaw. <laughs> okay, so we're a bit like these frozen shrimp. <laughs> yeah. We have to thaw in our own time. Learning to trust others takes time, particularly when experience has taught us that if we let others get close to us, they will hurt or abandon us. Rushing the process doesn't work. Yeah, it sure doesn't. Okay, it's like force feeding somebody. Yeah, I'm going to shove this kindness down your throat whether you want it or not. Okay, if we are the ones who have trouble with trust or closeness, we have to be courageous and allow ourselves to receive warmth and help from others, enduring the discomfort caused by our previous experiences as we slowly learn to trust these relationships. So what can be helpful here is recognizing uh, that we have the... Um, the automatic 
mode of conceptualizing situations as dangerous. You know, some people because of past experiences, or just like some people automatically when they go in a group of strangers is, uh, well, they all know each other and I'm going to be left out. Okay, so there's lots of just habits of looking at situations that we're often not even aware of that, you know, come up and then we play them out. So I think one way for us to look at that is to be aware of how we have these things come up automatically and then be aware when we're entering those situations and say to ourselves, you know, I don't have to replay that way of thinking and feeling and acting. You know, I can do something different in this situation. Yeah. And then that opens us up to to really trying different kinds of thoughts and interpretations and different kinds of behavior instead of staying in a rut all the time. Yeah, so it's an, it's interesting to uh, to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of situations, what kind of people do uh, are we just like instinctively aware of and feel threatened by, even though we don't know the people and we've never been in in that particular situation. Um, it was interesting, some years ago, um, we had a woman come up here. Um, we asked her to come. She was African-American and to talk about race relationships with us. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting. It was right after the uh, time when, uh, in Washington, D.C., there had been some kind of it was a march for life, but then there were other people from other groups there. Anyway, there was one uh, Indian man who was beating drums and talking about peace and so on. And one of the uh, teenage kids who was right, uh, you know, anti-abortion kind of came up to him. Do you remember this when this happened? And... um and there was a picture that appeared in, in many papers of this kid who was looking at the, the Indian man. Um, and the, the woman who came, Sandy, uh, who by the way got killed in, in a, uh, a, a, yeah, in an air, no, it was a water plane, a water plane accident. Um, anyway, uh, it was interesting because she took out this picture and she said, okay, what, what do you think this kid, uh, is feeling towards the Indian man? Okay. And we went around in a circle and people had different thoughts, you know. She and I were, were both together, you know. I thought, you know, he's smirking. Yeah. And uh, but other people didn't see that. Sandy thought also he was smirking, you know. And then we we also talked about what uh, what kind of people, uh, if we just see them on the street, do we feel mm, you know afraid of, or we have to be careful around. Yeah, and this is going to be different for women than for men, and it's going to be different from people in minorities and people who aren't, and it's going to be different for people who uh, who are in a minority in one country but are the majority population in another country. Yeah, uh, but you know, so it's interesting to, to look at this kind of stuff and seeing how it comes from our mind. It's not coming from the situation. Yeah. And how our ways of thinking us uh, tra often trapped us, trap us in this way. Okay. 
So if we're trying to help others who have learned to fear compassion or friendship, we have to go in knowing that things won't always go smoothly. We must let go of the expectation that those we seek to help will automatically respond to our efforts with appreciation, gratitude, and affection. Okay, so you're a child who has been beaten and you've been taken out of the home and, you know, you're like disoriented and I'm going to take you in and you're going to live with me and everything's going to be hunky-dory and, uh, you know, you'll just, you know, I'm going to save you or... Or even that person doesn't have the thing of I'm going to save somebody, but I'm going to provide what they need. And the child will respond by uh, eating it up and appreciating. But the kid's not ready yet. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you really have to not push yourself on somebody, but also not step away so that they feel that you're abandoning them. And you never get it right, because there is no right. There is no perfect, uh, you know, point of not infringing on them and not backing away, because in any particular moment, uh, they may need one thing or another. Mm -hmm. It's not always the same. So paying attention and responding to the cues they give us, their nonverbal behavior, their level of talkativeness, we should not try to get too close too quickly. We must be willing to patiently weather the storms, sending a constant message of compassion. I am here for you. You are worth caring about. I will not hurt you. I will wait patiently and will be there when you are ready. Okay. So how do you, you can't say that to the child, you know, that's not going to work. And you can't say it to an adult, you know. So you have to show it by your behavior. You have to show it, yeah, you know, by your behavior, your tone of voice, what words you use how close you stand or how far away you stand when you're talking to them. Um, you know, it depends on so many factors. And we uh, often, I think on both ends, if we're the person who doesn't feel secure, we're often not aware of the particular verbal or nonverbal things that make us feel insecure. Yeah, we're not aware. We just react. Yeah. Even if the other person is doing, is acting in completely good faith and not trying to harm, we're not aware of our buttons and we react. Similarly, the other person who's trying to befriend somebody or be kind to a child isn't always aware of how they come across to other people. Yeah, and we may think we're coming across as friendly, uh, but other people are picking it up as smothering. Or we may think that we're not being intrusive on their privacy and giving them space, but they may feel that we're backing away too much. Yeah, so it's one of these, um, you know, as with everything with human beings, is there's no one size fits all perfect way of doing things. And we, uh, as limited beings ourselves, we just have to do the best we can, you know, and then afterwards assess and, you know, modify and, and so on. And be ready for things being very different than how we expected. Um, learning how to read people's nonverbal cues because sometimes we can really misread their nonverbal cues and think they're feeling one thing when they're not uh, feeling that. So there's a lot of um, sensitivity needed here. Yeah, and patience. 
just, you know, to give people space. Yeah, even when we want to be close to them. (laughs) Step back, give them space. And this happens in families a lot, you know, with brothers and sisters and so on. You know, one sibling wants to be close, the other one doesn't. Yeah, or one sibling wants to be close but doesn't know how to be close. So they send out signals that the other one picks up as being, you know, go away, but actually that's not what they mean. Okay. Are you picking, can you find situations in your own experience when this happens? Hmm. Okay, paying attention and responding to the cues people give us their nonverbal behavior, their level of talkativeness. We should not try to get too close too quickly. We must be... uh, Yeah, so I read all of that already. Okay. So although we can be sensitive to their suffering and offer help, warmth, and support, compassion is more about steadfastness than action when we're interacting with people whose lives have taught them to fear closeness rather than be comforted by it. Okay, so steadfastness. You're there. You're not judging. Yeah. Uh, We can't change anybody, but we can help to create conditions in which change is possible. This process can be a long, difficult one, and sometimes it can be too much for one person or one family to handle. This is why places like the Hutton Settlement exist, with its entire staff dedicated to providing a consistent, safe, and nurturing environment. It's unrealistic to think that we can be everything to another person. Yeah. In many cases, compassion means helping them to find resources and connect with supportive communities. So I uh, frequently tell parents, especially when their kids are young, make sure that there are other adults in their life that they feel close to and can speak with openly. Because when your kid gets to be a teenager... Uh, very likely, uh, you know, as a parent, everything you say and do is not going to work, okay? Um, but you want your kid to have, uh, oh, I see, I hit a button, huh? Uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> uh, uh, but when You want your kid to have access to mature people who can give them good guidance, even if it's not you. You can't build those relationships at the time they're a teenager. You have to build them when they're little kids with aunts and uncles, neighbors, friends of the family, so that your child grows up with other adults that they feel comfortable about, comfortable with, that they can trust, yeah? And then when they hit teenage years, they can speak to that person, yeah? Uh, There was one uh, in my family, we didn't live near any of our relatives. Um, Our relatives were on the East Coast and we were here. Uh, They were in the Midwest and we were here. Anyway, there was uh, one uh, other family that we were very close. Our families were close. And the woman in that family, uh, as it turned out many years later, was working at the same place where I got a job. And it was at a time when I was in college and, you know, talking to my parents was extremely difficult. Uh, yeah, because everything, 
they would say, what, what are you doing? And if I told them, um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so it was difficult communicating. But it, it, was, it was very helpful um, because sometimes I, this other lady, I would just, she was a social worker there, and uh, I was doing marijuana research. Um, and get, no, this was my job in college. I earned my way through through the last two years of college by doing marijuana research, two projects, actually three projects, two paid by the government and one self-funded. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I was, you know, sometimes I would stop by her office and chat with her. And she knew my family. You know, but I knew she wouldn't tell my parents what I was telling her. Yeah. So that was, that was, you know, very helpful. And it made me see that, uh, you know, how important it is as parents to not think that you're the one and only people that, that your kids are going to depend on or love. That, you know, you're launching them into the world and they're going to have a lot of different people. Yeah, that they're close to at different times in their life. You're always going to be their parent. Don't worry about that. You don't stop being somebody's parent, although sometimes you may wish you could um, when they're 40 years old and still bringing the laundry home. Um, yeah, and asking you for money because their car broke down. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, so in many cases, compassion means helping them to find resources and connect with supportive communities. Yeah. And so here's the reflection at the end of the chapter. Learning to feel safe can take time when we've been taught to feel threatened by situations or relationships. I don't think we can say we've been taught to be feel threatened. I would say we learn to feel threatened because taught implies somebody is teaching us with a motivation. And nobody, I don't think people, you know, deliberately want to teach people to, to feel threatened. In some cases, you may have somebody who has very severe psychological problems, and they do, but in most cases, it's people, you know, we are afflicted sentient beings, and we do hard things that harm, harm people. Um, but we learn from situations, and sometimes we learn the, the, what isn't true. Yeah, we make a story about this situation isn't safe. Um, and the situation, if we could open our eyes, we would, we might see that it is safe. But wherever we are, we're seeing it that way. And it, uh, like the shrimp, uh, we have to defrost at our own time. Um, I was talking once with my brother. He's a doctor and, um, we were talking about when you tell, you know, when you tell somebody, when you tell a patient that they're terminal, you know, and when you let them just find it out by yourself. And, you know, when as a doctor do you encourage people to prepare for their death? And when do you, you know, uh, like what about if somebody's in total denial and they're going down here hill and they need to make preparations, uh, practical ones and spiritual ones and emotional ones, but they're not doing it because they're in denial. And my brother commented that he doesn't force anybody to, uh, to confront their death. He says some people just aren't ready. Yeah. And so his, uh, his thing is, you know, let them come to the, uh, 
you you give the care and you provide the situation, but you let them come to that awareness themselves. You don't sit them down and, and say, we've got to have a big talk, and you know you're dying and you better prepare. Uh, you know, he said some people, they can't take it in until they're ready. Mm-hmm. Because you you get this a lot with people wanting to have interventions to make somebody else realize something. Or somebody has a drug alcohol product uh, problem and you want to intervene and, you know, get them into treatment. And sometimes that kind of intervention is very important and you need to do that. But at other times... Uh, what some of the, the, cause I work with inmates, what some of them have told me is that if the court, the court may assign them to a rehab program and they go to rehab because it's certainly better than going to prison, but they kind of fake the whole rehab process and, you know, they're getting drugs on the outside at the same time as they're doing the rehab. Um, and, you know, they tell me, you have to get to a point where you are at the bottom of the ba- barrel and you realize yourself that you need to change. And, you know, they say nobody else can make you change or get you to that point, you know. But you're not going to change until, you know, you're smack at the bottom and you see that you you got yourself there, yeah. So that that can be a, a helpful thing to know when we're working with other people, yeah. and also you know if we have that problem ourselves, of always finding a way to wiggle out of difficult situations, so that we uh, never actually confront that we have that kind of problem. Okay. So can uh, so learning to feel safe can take time. So consider this is the reflection. Consider a situation in your life in which you felt intimidated by closeness. What did you need then? What could others have done to help you learn to trust them? Okay. So to really think about specific situations and how we feel intimidated by different different people or groups of people or whatever. Now think of a situation in which you were in the other role, wanting to connect with someone who feels th- frightened or threatened by closeness. Imagine what it would feel like to be steadfast and patiently committed to allowing the other person to thaw gradually and to accept your support, kindness, and affection only as they become ready. Yeah, so an interesting reflection to put ourselves on both both sides of it. So questions or comments? People have uh, some thoughts about what they just heard? I have to say that it took a long, long time in my life to realize the, f- the feeling unsafe was not a reality that had to continue. And if it wasn't for my spiritual practice, I don't know exactly what would have happened. But what I do know is that when I was open up to challenging that worldview, that my entire world got a whole lot larger. There was something about the, the f- not feeling safe that would bring me into situations where I was already intimidated, judging, narrowed down, and ready to flee, even before I walked in the door. But because I challenged, because what used to make me feel unsafe no longer existed. So it's the whole mm-hmm. idea about how this memory becomes a lot more real than what's actually you're experiencing in life. But it took... It took a long time. Like, so it says to be patient, 
you know, and your friends get to be patient with you to a certain extent. And then you really have to take the bull by the horns. Yeah. You know, they can't, they can't walk you through that door of emotional freedom. You've got to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about the extremes of, uh, not being able to trust and, um, how the damage it can do. Like, uh, people, uh, someone who might say, I don't trust the government or I don't trust election results. I'm going to go riot kind of thing. Or even, uh, uh, you know, segment of our population that really probably has the least of fear, namely white males. Like they have the, probably the least of fear, um, actually end up doing the most, uh, like mass shootings, right? The majority of them are angry white men, but it's, it shows the power of, um, how even as adults we can learn to not fear and not to trust through social media or what and how it could be um, taken to an extreme mm -hmm. and um, you know violence can happen. It's kind of an irony that white men, you know white men probably have the least to fear and yet do sometimes do things that are fear based that are totally distorted. Yeah. So how do you communicate with people? like that, and especially when they're young and they're growing up, you know, because that kind of thing can, can start when they're younger, you know, and then, yeah, get acted out when they're older. Yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. As a classroom teacher, um, high school, I experience this a lot, and so the... Uh, couple of the call just I don't know how to have a question just a more of an observation is that you have a kid that's pushing you away and the only real approach is just to continue to be patient and kind and a lot of times they will push back really hard and it's really hard then to not maintain that kindness but you have to just remember that pushing back is only going to make it worse for them. And so you just stay with that kindness, stay with that kindness. And a lot of times you don't know that you're making progress. Yeah. I had two kids this year that really made my life difficult. And they, <laughs> and they both came on the last day, which was a half day and no, almost no kids came and they both came to give me a hug. And they were two of the most difficult kids I had all year. And so if I'd given up, right. But yeah. so, so, this is just an encouragement. It can take a long time, and you may not even see the results yeah. for a long time. Yeah. I think as an adult, um, I mean, maybe every one of us can relate to this in some way, but it takes a long time to actually realize that you even have, that one even has this problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not receptive to people. Oh, I'm, I don't trust people. Well, I act like I do, but... You know, at a deeper level, n n no. And it take, I think it takes a long time even to recognize that that's what's going on for us. Um, so, and I, I also think just, just as to support what John said about holding space for others, that the more I have learned to hold that space for myself, the more mm. successful I am at being holding it, at holding it for others. Mm. So it's really important um, in that way. To give yourself a chance yeah. to overcome whatever fear you yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then being able to hold, recognize it in others and hold them, mm -hmm. hold, just hold space. It's, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed um, is what's helped me, like you 20 years ago, or Yangtze Rinpoche, is they didn't, you guys didn't buy into the story. You didn't go into, <laughs> oh, poor you, oh, poor you, you're broken. It's like, yes, you feel this way but that's not actually reality. And so um, changing the way people approached me, now when I'm working with people, mm -hmm. I can be like, I know you believe that you're nothing. I'm not going to mirror that to you because that's not true. Like you are amazing, you are wonderful. I will keep telling you that over and over. I know you don't believe it. <laughs> But it is the truth and not, and not going into that spiral of, oh, yeah, I can't believe they did that to you. Or, yeah, you have all the right in the world to feel that way and not feeding mm -hmm. into those storylines, which we sometimes think is the compassionate thing to feed that victimization yes. when it's like, you know, 
we don't know what was happening. You know, everyone's doing the best they can. It's not reality, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point about feeding the victimization. Yeah, and then we think we're being compassionate. You know, poor you, this happened, da, 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 da. Uh, and, and that's feeding in the other person the feeling that they can never overcome it. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, if you, if you really give the message, you know, you're sharp, you're intelligent, you're worthwhile, you can do this. I say I really like the point you made about mm, helping, being the kind of relationship where the, you let the person come to this on their own because that's then empowering for them. Mm. Whereas if, you know, sometimes if you create situations for people and they aren't empowered, then what are they learning? Mm. You know, so I think like what John said about, you know, what you were doing there, it's like you didn't wrestle those kids down and, you know, you just kind of like, <laughs> they, they have to come to it and you're just this, like this consistent... Yeah. You know, working on your stuff in your own way so that you can be consistent. Yeah. Steadfast, I guess, is Russell's word. Yeah. Okay. So let's dedicate.